Hi, everybody. Welcome. I am Kristen Young. I'm the Director of Clinical Services for Heron Project, and I'm here today to talk about um, support groups. We'll be talking about Heron Project support groups and also other um, support groups that you can access throughout your communities as well. And I'm here today with Rebecca Hellman. Hello. How are you? You want to introduce yourself and just tell sure. us about who you are? Sure, sure, sure. I am Rebecca Hellman. I am um, coordinator of the family support groups here at the Heron Project. Um, and I've spent my professional career working in this field, um, in the field of addiction and recovery, substance use disorder, as well as working in um, public high schools and as well and my private practice as well. Awesome. Thank you. I'm so excited that you're here today. Um, Rebecca and I work very closely together and both of us run support groups for Heron Project as well. So um, <clears throat> hopefully we can persuade a few of you who aren't already joining us to join us. So Rebecca, you wanna tell us a little bit about what support groups Heron Project offers to start? Sure, so I think the idea of um, families needing support groups um, stems from a parallel of what we would ask somebody early in recovery to do, which is to find you know, find your tribe, find a network of people that um, experience the same things you're experiencing, feel the same things you feel, and, and then you're not alone. So our support groups mimic that um, and encourage that. Um, so we have family support groups for any member of a family who loves somebody with substance use disorder. Um, mothers, fathers, um, grandparents, friends, aunts, uncles, siblings, all of it. Um, everybody is welcome. And then we have specific support groups for parents, um, parents of adults, as well as parents of adolescents, because they're gonna be different dynamics with different age groups. Um, we have a sibling support group that is starting soon um, for siblings and a spousal support group as well. So we're able to identify the differences of what people will struggle with. Um, and, and focus. We also have um, three, currently three, um, going to be four soon grief support groups. And so those support groups are for loved ones who have lost somebody to addiction, substance use disorder. Um, and, and those unfortunately um, are full and continue, those numbers continue to grow. So, um, which just speaks volumes to the need for all of these groups for everybody. People are hurting. And, and I so. found, <clears throat> which is the reason why we started this way back when, that um, the grief support groups, there aren't a ton of places for people to go to get grief support specific to um, substance use disorder. So yes. it is different. It is very, very different. It is. And I think that that is one of the issues that our families bring to this grief support group because the stigma of substance use disorder um, while alive doesn't end with their death. So that stigma continues, it just gets passed to the family members and the loved ones. And so grieving when a community or a world would come out and support you with no stigma to a, a cancer or old age or anything that is um, without stigma, is much different than carrying the weight of that stigma in grief. Yeah. So a lot of the work um, is about being able to say things out loud to people they couldn't say anywhere else, even in other grief support groups, which is just incredibly important. Absolutely. And I do want to also just make sure everybody are aware we're starting a new specific grief support group that I'm really excited about because I know this is an area that I've touched upon with many different families. Um, we all know that substance use and you know substance use disorder have a tendency to run in families. So it's becoming more and more common that families have lost a loved one to a substance and then are also dealing with another loved one who is currently using um, or working towards recovery in some way. Um, so we're starting up a, a grief support group specific to people who are struggling with that because they don't fit really in either place. It's really tough. Um, and I'm excited to announce, you know, to be able to say that we're going to be doing that. I don't think there's anybody else doing that right now either. No, I, I don't think there's a lot of specific grief support groups for substance use disorder um, to begin in with. general, yeah. but I certainly think that, the, you know, this new group will be very unique and, and the issues that are will be brought up in this group are unique um, to that population because it's, you have the fears 
of the possibilities of somebody who still may be actively using or even actively in recovery, as well as the, the pain of the grief. And the, those, those two things are hard to separate if you're experiencing them together. So, right. Yeah. And the um, trauma, I mean, let's just be real. There's a ton of trauma in this, whether your loved one is living or not. Yes. And when you've lost someone and you're dealing, struggling with another one, your PTSD is off the charts, right? So it's a lot harder to do what, you know, professionals are asking of the family members when there's that level of trauma. And by no means am I minimizing the trauma for those of you that are struggling with a, with an active loved one right now, there's trauma involved in that as well. There's so much trauma here, which is why these groups are so incredibly important. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and, and, and trauma in, in grief and trauma in life, it, it manifests the same. It, there's no, you know, we're going to see this, the same symptoms and the same experiences. Um, if you have lost somebody and are still loving somebody who is actively using or in recovery, it's hard to, to um, manage or navigate when that trauma pops up and how to shut it down necessarily to get through the day or, you know, it, 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 there are just a number of dynamics. It's multi-layered. So our families need, need, need these supports. Yeah, need so much support. And, and that's one of the things I, I, I like to talk about when we're talking to families as well is oftentimes as a, I'm a family member myself, um, I consider myself to be in recovery from codependency. Um, mm -hmm. And one of the things that, that I know is that I have done things that make me feel crazy, right? I, at times would sit back and be like, oh my God, I'm losing my mind. I'm insane, right? Who am I? I have totally lost myself. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the areas where I think these support groups are incredibly important is to go and understand why I'm making these choices or I'm acting in this way. I haven't actually lost my mind. It is the effects of trauma. It's how our, you know, how our psyches, how our neurology um, helps us is trying to help us survive a situation. So, you know, I often say it's not us. It's not the person that's crazy when you're talking about trauma, it's the situation. So the person is responding to that situation in a very normal way to mm -hmm. but the situation itself is abnormal, right? So that is where, so if you feel like you're going crazy, remind yourself that you're not crazy. The situation <laughs> is. And sure. that your mind is doing exactly what the human mind does in a situation like this, because that this is a very stressful disease and it's very contrary to um, any other disease. So any other disease, we wrap our love around our loved one and it's completely appropriate, right? It's completely yeah. appropriate to caretake and to, to be right in there. Unfortunately, this disease does not respond to that. So we're doing that and we keep doing that and doing that and doing that. And it's actually making the situation worse. And then we become completely, like we don't know what to do, right? right? And that's where it becomes so hard. Um, there was actually a study done and I don't know the study right now and I wish I had it in front of me. I know Maureen Cavanaugh had sent it to me and I'll try to be better at finding it before I quote studies, but I swear to God, the study does exist. Um, but it showed that, the area of the brain that are, lights up when our loved one is thinking about their drug of choice, right? Is the exact same area of our brains that light up when we're thinking about getting our loved one into treatment. Mm -hmm. So we are literally addicted to saving our loved ones, like Correct. biologically addicted. Mm -hmm. So this is why you guys need help. I needed help. We all need help when we're here. It's not something that you can manage on your own. No, and what's uh, what's so fascinating about what you said is that for people to be able to notice that phenomenon in other people is much easier to do than to notice it in themselves. Absolutely. So when you're so when we're in a support group and we hear somebody else describe a situation that seemingly feels out of control, we're able to identify that when we talk about it ourselves. We don't identify it that way. So having somebody else say, wait a minute, that's the same as when I, yeah. and, and share those experiences. I mean, the shared experiences of that phenomenon, what you just said of questioning your own sanity and feeling that compulsion to get them to help the same as they are, you know, feel the compulsion to use. That is the, the validation that support groups provide for people. So when we can't notice it ourselves, somebody else can notice it for us and then we say we have the light bulb. I know anybody who's ever been in a, in a support group or has led one knows when that happens. There's a moment where it's like, oh, I do that. Yeah. 
I do that too. Um, and then, and because it's validated, it doesn't lose, it loses that, oh no, there's something wrong with me. Mm -hmm. We're all, it's a shared experience. So absolutely. It normalizes it. And then we can also, and it's easier to hear from someone that's been there that what you're doing isn't working as well. I think that's where the peer support comes in. Right. You know, it's, it's easy to say to someone that's never been there where you've never been there and you don't understand. Right. Um, or sometimes people that have never been there, the things that they say are very triggering and hurtful to us, right? So a support group is, it's a much safer place for us emotionally. And that's one of the things I hear from my group all the time is they just love to go to a place where no one's going to tell them to just kick their kid out. You know, no one's going to tell them the opposite. Cause these are the things we hear, right? Kick them out. Or it's, well, you just need to let them live with you and wait and everything will get better. You know, just you know, basically just enable the heck out of them. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's it. So it's a, it's a safe place to go. I want to throw out there to everybody, feel free to throw questions out to Rebecca or myself or both of us, if you have any, um, <clears throat> doesn't just have to be support group related. It can be about any, any questions you have for a loved one, um, or yourself who may be struggling and please put those questions in the Q and a box down at the bottom of your screen. If you don't have a Q&A box, that's for people on Zoom, I should say, if there's anyone on Zoom. Um, people that are on Facebook, you can put your questions right in the comment section and they will get to us and just give us a few minutes to you know, notice it and be able to get it into the conversation. But we will answer all the questions that are given to us. So again, if you're on Facebook, just put your question right in the comments. Um, it is not confidential. So please don't put any identifying information out there if you're discussing a loved one um, and we will certainly try not to to do that either even if you do we'll we'll try to keep it hidden but please try to remember don't use any names or identifying information awesome. yeah so um i was also thinking about something else and of course now that i did that it has escaped my mind <laughs> I, I would you you had said something earlier about how your group um really has responded to one another. Yeah. And I think that's something that has, um, I found true in all of my support groups, grief or, or family, is that there is a cohesion and a sense of family that develops um, from the, the group members yep. um, that supersedes, transcends um, the one hour a week that we meet. Oh, and yeah. I mean, that is the stuff at, as a, as a as a facilitator or therapist, that's the dream that you can take what you experience, what you feel, what heals you, and then bring it out with you into your life. And um, a number of support groups um, have done just that. Some have created um, group chats that continue throughout the week. Um, and some have gotten together um, in person when when we were you know able to do that in the world. Um, one of my support groups um, have done a number of our Team Heron Project events where they raise money and then they run. So we've done Falmouth and we've done Spartan. And it's just a, it's a wonderful way to enjoy those connections that are made. Even if it's from a place of pain that you get to meet those people, they become part of what is healing to you. And yeah. I mean, that's, again, that's, that's a gift that I, you know, not, not every support group I think gets, but, but I, I feel that the ones here at the Heron Project have absolutely been nurtured that way. I totally agree. I mean, and it's also really nice. I have a lot of individuals who will call each other, like if somebody's having a crisis and typically we have nobody to call, right? There isn't somebody, there isn't a crisis center for, you know, the recent issue that we're having with our loved one and they can call each other and, and that's really, really nice. You know, my group always will, my group will say things like, well, what would Kristen say, right? <laughs> Which I think is very, I it, it, I love to hear that. It makes me, but I'm like, you guys know this. It's not what would Kristen say anymore. It's what would you say? Would you, yes. Because you know what it is. Yes. That, and they can remind each other because when you're in a crisis, I mean, even myself, I teach people to do this. When I'm in a crisis, I can't think clearly enough to even remember what I would say. So it's it's very helpful in that way too. And my groups call I, them Rebecca-isms. 
<laughs> oh, I love that. <laughs> yeah. And actually, while we're talking about it, um, what separates us out from a lot of the other support groups is that our groups are actually run by licensed clinicians. So most other support groups are peer led, which don't get me wrong, I think are awesome. So if you're going to learn to cope or Al-Anon, um, Al-Anon has the 12 steps involved in it and also Families Anonymous as well. Um, they have the 12 steps. Those that can be amazing. Um, what ones am I missing, Rebecca? Well, learn to cope, certainly. Allies in recovery. Allies in recovery, yep. Um, so there's a lot of great ones. In the, I mean, Google is your friend here. Google, read about them. I yeah. know Learn to Cope has a really active website. Oh, and then there's um, Magnolia New Beginnings, which is run by Maureen Kavanaugh, which is amazing. They have a very active Facebook group that yeah. you can post on 24-7. They're offering support groups, I believe, three nights a week now. Um, and one of them is sort of a self-care related one where you can learn coping strategies, which I think is so amazing. So, um, you know, check that out. It's, it's uh, Magnolia New Beginnings. You can find them on Facebook um, and, and friend them. I think she has a website as well. So those are all awesome. Um, I have found that the downside to some of the peer groups, and I'm only saying this if this has affected any of you, um, is that sometimes there are family members in there that can push what worked for them on other individuals. Um, and people come out feeling like, oh my gosh, they're just telling me I have to kick out my loved one, my son or my daughter, and I just can't do that. So they never go back, um, mm -hmm. you know? And, and I always, I wanna say, keep trying, keep trying different groups, have different cultures, but you're not gonna find that here at Heron Project. That's one of the things that we really work towards is meeting everybody where they're at. Every, you know, No matter where you are, nobody's gonna push you into anything. We're just gonna help you learn about what would potentially be the best practice for you, but also help you figure out what you can do right now that you're ready for. Um, you know, so I, I, that is, it's one of the things we heard the most. It's part of the reasons why we started these groups to begin with was to give a safe place for families to come um, no matter where they are in their journey. I would, I would add to that, that because um, it's, not, it's not just Kristen or just Rebecca, whenever I um, facilitate a group, I know that behind me are all the other team members at Heron Project. So I know that if I am faced with an issue in a group that I think, you know what, I need to refer you to Angie. I need to get you to our treatment navigation team. I need, I need you to, to bring this up. It, you know, I, I know that I'm not doing this alone, that whatever issues they, that come up, um, because we're meeting people where they are, that could be in crisis also. So, um, you know, I always, I always know that it's not, it's, these are all Heron Project <laughs> groups. I know I have the team um, and I frequently will leave the number for treatment navigation in a chat of a, of a group. Um, I want people to know that that exists, that, um, you know, you, you can come up with a plan, you can prepare yourself, you can take care of yourself and, and be ready and you still might need help. And so I want people to, to know how to access the rest of the help that Heron Project offers. So. Yeah. Um, oh. oh, nice. <laughs> Lot, we, we got a comment, lots of shout outs for Rebecca's Tuesday night group. We love Rebecca. <laughs> Rebecca loves doing this work. So I think that, that uh, that's what helps is that, you know, I, there are, there are clinicians, there are people that um, get to work in places that nurture who, who they are. And that's, that's what this is for me. So, yeah. um, you know, to be able to say, yes, I will gladly run a grief group. I will gladly run three grief groups. You know, if that's the need, it, it helps nurture who I am as a professional um, and as a person. So I, I can be loved, but, but there's more gratitude coming from me outward for sure. Oh, absolutely. I was just actually having this discussion in my group the other night about, um, actually, I think it was, it was with one of the group members about how much I've learned from them. If it wasn't for this, I've been, I had run a Tuesday night group. I'm actually just moving away from that to a different group, which makes me, ha makes me very sad. Um, but I'm going to miss them dearly. I've been running it now for about six years. Um, and they're the ones that actually helped me figure out 
what works more than doesn't, right? I mean, I, I, you read the books and you get the schooling and you do all of that, but there's nothing like what you get when you're working with people, right? And it's, Absolutely. it's helped me immensely, both personally and professionally. So I, I would agree. Yeah, I would agree. But the, the longer groups go um, and function together, they create their own culture, their own cohesion, yeah. their own sense. And so there are certain things that you find yourself doing with groups um, that you did, hadn't set out to do. Um, certainly reading, um, I know you've done this with, with some of your groups too, but choosing a book and reading it through with a group um, I don't think I ever thought at the beginning that I would would do that. That's not that's not my thing. That's not my style. And I found myself saying to one of our family support groups, "You're asking your loved ones to heal and recover, but do you know what you're asking them to do? Have you read what? You know, have you read the big book? Have you read you know any of the the work that you're asking them to do?" And they said no. And I said, "Well, let's let's do it." You know what I mean? And so we we took the big book. And we read um, a section every week until we got through the whole thing. And there, it, the idea was just the perspective that we want our loved ones well, mm -hmm. and we feel relief when when they get into treatment. Yeah. And then there's a part of us that says, "Okay, good, my job is done." And yet we don't then get the results we want. Yeah. And so I think that that was important. But again, I would have never. That would have. That was not what I set out to do when yeah. when I when we started and yet that's what the group needed and we did it and it was amazing. So. Yeah, yeah I totally agree. I, there, are, I mean, listen to me today with all my studies, but there <laughs> actually have been studies done on, um, on when it comes to family members learning about substance use disorder. And the more studies are showing, the more learning that we do as family members, the better the outcome typically is. And we don't think like that because we don't see ourselves as needing to do any work. We see it's just, well, if you just get into treatment or should just get into treatment, everything would be fine. And I'm here to tell you, it's actually harder. They get in, and those of you that have been through this a few times, they get into treatment. And when they're coming out of treatment, oftentimes it's harder than before they even went in. Um, it's a completely new dynamic. You don't, nobody has the skills to manage the anxiety that you get when your loved one has a, a bit of um, re sobriety recovery under their belt. There's a ton of anxiety that comes around, comes along with that, that I've found most of my family members are not expecting. So we need to learn about it so we can be prepared, not in a negative way. It's not, I think you should be prepared for relapse. That's not what it is. It's just to be prepared for the anxiety that sobriety is going to bring because it does. It's it's this, I've had so many family members reach out to me and be like, I thought this was going to be the fix. And I feel crazier than I did before. Right. You know, and it's, it's like the, I'm, I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop. And that can last for a lot of people for like a year. Even yeah. if your loved one makes it to a year of recovery, that mm -hmm. year is going to be tough both for them because of things like post-acute withdrawals and, you know, the fact that they're a raw nerve work, walking around in life without their coping strategy and they haven't developed any new ones, um, it's going to be tough on them. So you're going to see a lot of behaviors from them that aren't going to feel good. Um, and then you're going to be constantly walking on eggshells, waiting for the other shoe to drop. So it's tough. So you got to have the support system in place to help you manage that because it's hard. You have anything to add to that, Rebecca? No, I was just re I was just reading, I think a comment came up, but um, the, the, I, I frequently say in my groups, when you said the waiting for the other shoe to drop, the, the, one of the good things about um, substance use disorder and the patterns of behavior that we see is that if you try something once and you think that's what you're ready to do until you do it, if it doesn't get you the outcome that you're looking for, the good news is chances are you'll get another opportunity. Yes. So when we have those codependent relationships and we're doing the same dance we've always done, here's the good news. You can try it differently the next time. Um, but that, but that is, it is the dance. And so if our loved ones have changed their dance steps and we haven't, it's not going to work. We have to do the, we have to do the work we too. Have to do. And let yeah. me tell you from having lived it, um, we want to control everything. I did. I wanted to control everything mm -hmm. and we don't even know we're doing it. We don't even understand what it is we're doing because we look at the person like they're not capable. Um, and so we feel like we have to step in and fix everything. And that actually leads to more issues than it solves. 
We did get um, a comment. Um, support groups changed everything for my family, which is awesome. So glad to hear it. Laura McCowan, I'm so glad somebody brought her up. Her book is amazing. If anybody gets an opportunity to read it, um, it's it's called We Are the Luckiest, and her name is Laura McGowan. I actually have known her personally from for years now, um, and then she wrote a book, and I was like, oh, I'm going to check this out and see what she has to say, and I was absolutely blown away. I didn't even know her whole story because I don't know her well enough um, to really know all of that, um, but it was phenomenal. And I think it can be helpful for both your loved ones and yourself. And I'll tell you why in a second, I'm going to finish reading this. But Laura McCowan said, one person who understands our experiences exactly may be the necessary palliative for pain stretching into change. So that, see how amazing she is? Like she really is. She's really amazing. That's awesome. Um, her book again is called, We Are the Luckiest. It's her journey through alcoholism. She was a very high functioning alcoholic. So um, it took her life a while to slowly fall mm. apart before she was able to get herself back together. It took her a year from the day she decided she wanted to stop drinking to actually make it into recovery. So um, I always say that because we don't understand why our loved ones say they wanna be in recovery and they don't wanna be using anymore yet they're still using. There's a lot of neurobiology behind that. It's it's really here that's the problem. Sure. Even though they've decided they want to stop, it's not that easy. I always like to refer to chocolate cake when it comes to this, because for me, that's what I can relate to. You know, if there's chocolate cake in the fridge and I've said I don't want to eat chocolate cake anymore, or I, I'm trying to go on a diet, that chocolate cake is um, it's going to be screaming to me, right? <laughs> so. And their cravings are probably a hundred times stronger than what I have for chocolate cake. Although I, sometimes I think I might be addicted. So maybe not, I don't know. I couldn't tell you, but um, we don't have the, the, the neurological effects of that as, as intensely, obviously as a substance does. Um, and the other thing I love about her book is not only does it talk about that experience and the why behind it, she also talks about whatever your thing is. And we all have a thing. Our loved one's thing just happens to be substances, but we all have a thing. There's things that I do in my life where I could potentially make a better choice. And, you know, and, and this is for me, the most obvious one is alcohol with this. That's so not necessarily for me, but in general for our society where you don't necessarily have substance use disorder, but you still come home every night and maybe have a glass of wine or maybe once a month you go out and you drink way too much um, mm -hmm. on a night out with your friends, right? And just because you don't have substance use disorder doesn't necessarily mean that's the best choice, right? We can all agree that alcohol is not necessarily the best choice, right? just like me sitting down as a diabetic eating half of a chocolate cake is not the best choice. It's not good for me. Right. So we all have these things that we do that aren't okay. necessarily the best choice. And her book is about that. So not mm -hmm. only could it help you understand your loved one better, but it might get you thinking a little bit about the, the fancy term is maladaptive coping strategy, right? So the, the coping, <laughs> right. The coping strategies that you have in your life that maybe aren't the best and she kind of talks to you about how you might be able to change those two. So you get a double whammy <laughs> in there. That's awesome. Um, you can look at yourself and kind of understand your loved one's journey a little bit more. So again, it's, we are the luckiest. I swear to you, I'm not being paid to, <laughs> to say this. Um, you know, it just got brought up in a comment and I love Laura and I love her story. So that's wonderful. I haven't read it. I'm going to, I'm going to get it. It's awesome. It sounds, it sounds amazing. You want to read the next question? Um, please address the importance of connecting with others experiencing the same thing. Yeah. And I think we may have touched on it earlier too, but there's something so important, um, as humans, um, about feeling validated. Mm -hmm. So we can experience something and yet if it's ignored, we, it doesn't feel important when we, no matter what that is, it could be anything, but, but it's part of why I think, you know, there's such a, um, you know, we put something on Facebook or we put something out in social media and somebody validates it, there, there it becomes important. I, I think um, probably way too much to a fault um, in our world today, but for, for those of us experiencing pain, going and sitting with other people that are also experiencing that validates that for us. And that then becomes the healing. Yeah. So if you're not alone, then you have the, the, the option to heal. Um, and the ability to heal. And so I think, again, um, I know my groups are incredibly 
connected. Um, they help each other again throughout the week. Um, they are in touch with each other. They support one another. Um, a member recently lost her son um, and another member from a different part of the country went and made sure they were there at, at the services. Oh. You know, and while the rest of the group had come up with this incredible gift and flowers and things specifically for her, but then there was somebody there as well. And, you know, I think something that's important about our groups, you know, which we, you and I, I think, take for granted at this point, um, is that we've been doing this for a while, we've been doing it on Zoom. And way before Zoom was like the thing. Yeah, like so, <laughs> before anyone knew what Zoom was. We were way <laughs> ahead of our time, right? So, but what that does is it allows people from all over the country and sometimes all over the world to be able to connect. I don't know anything more powerful than knowing there is there are other people everywhere that have the shared experience. Mm -hmm. And that's incre that's incredibly powerful. So we can sign on and there are accents from all over this country. Yeah. Um, there are differences from all over this country and yet no matter where we're from the pain is the same the experiences are the same the fears are the same um and i, I don't i don't know of anything better than being able to walk into a room even if it's virtual um and know that you're not alone so to me that's the that's the that's the gift of support groups but doing it the way we've been doing it to me has magnified it because I think there are people all over this country that are so connected um, and have healed one another. Yeah, that's absolutely. And I also think the benefit is, is you get to be in the comfort of your own home, which feels safer. Safe. So, you know, we're talking mm -hmm. about things that don't feel safe and they don't feel comfortable and going into sort of like a cold basement of a church <laughs> or something like that, which I'm not saying there isn't benefit to by any means, because there is, of course, um, of course. But I think that one of the benefits to these groups is that you get to be sitting in this, in the comfort of your own home, um, under a warm blanket on your couch, right? Like, yep. and it makes it feel safer to share for a lot of people. At least that's what I've, I've found yeah. in my groups. Um, and I also want to throw out there because I'm such a science geek. I'm, an, I'm a neuro a neuro person. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of my degrees is in neuroscience. So I always like to throw out there that there is actually science behind some of this. The validation that Rebecca was talking about, it actually bites, our, bites us in the butt sometimes in social media. But in support groups, the dopamine rush that you get from the validation, um, it, it, it really, it's actually a neurological way to make yourself feel better. So, you know, I mean, we, we, we have antidepressants, which I think are a great tool. And I, I you know, I, I highly suggest anybody that's been struggling for a significant around, amount of time to try them. But before you go down that path, try some of this stuff too, because this actually does change the way that your brain is wired. And some of the happy drugs that our body produces mm -hmm. can, you know, it, it, this stuff can bring about. So support groups, physical activity, eating good nutrition, getting good sleep. Um, and I know I'm kind of going on a self-care rant here, but this is really gratitude. part of all of this gratitude, <laughs> um, which is hard to do when you're, you know, Absolutely. cortisol Absolutely. levels and your, you know, fight or flight is constantly being kicked in. But these are the things that can turn that switch off because fight or flight, it wreaks havoc on our bodies and our minds. And it's like a light switch. It really can either be on or off. So a lot of these things can turn the light switch off. So again, getting into support groups and talking about some of this meditation, sleep, exercise. And then when I say exercise, I'm not talking about like, you know, getting on a Peloton for an hour and a half. I'm talking about like taking a walk around the block for five minutes. Okay. Like that's either, even just a little bit of physical activity, movement. A movement. big difference. Yeah. Yes. Some kind of movement. So, um, although it, if you do want to jump on the Peloton, there's a number of our hair yeah, projects. We're all, Rebecca and I are both on the Peloton. So <laughs> feel free <laughs> join us in, and it's hard. <laughs> it's and really fun. hard. She and kicks fun. my butt all and the time. It's fun. It's fun. It's, it's a hard, it's a fun, hard when you're off of it. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> it's a lot looking at it. Well, you know, <laughs> what's interesting is that is, you know, as you're talking about it, yes, we, we did a ride, um, a couple of uh, maybe five or six members of the Heron project did a ride together, 
um, I think it was a week or so, a week or so ago. I, I missed and that it, one. I was so sad. But it was the same feeling. It was the same feeling as like with the, the support groups, like there we all were together. You know, I'm sure there's thousands of other people writing, but like we could just keep track of each other. And it was that being able to support one another with a, from a common place. It didn't matter who pedaled faster. Like it didn't right. matter. None of that mattered. It was just really cool to be able to do it together. So yeah. I think yeah. in Wellness Week, we got like 13 people from the Heron Project all riding together. And that one was <sighs> fun too. That was that was fun to watch everybody mostly beating me, but that was okay. I'm okay with it. <laughs> We're, still okay sister, so We're still I'm, moving. We're still moving. I'm happy. <laughs> um, it was, it was good. It's very, yeah. it's very nice to, it's, it's fun. It's fun know, to do things with people that, right. that you share things with. That's, yep. that's the goal. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So we should probably tell them where to find these support groups, right? Okay. <laughs> it's a, that's fantastic. So if, if, it's a good idea. Um, so heronproject.org, um, our site has tons and tons and tons of resources but one of the tabs um will you will be able to find um the registration for our online support groups it's under um, support i believe is the tab yep oh okay yep. um and you can you can look at you know specifically are they family supports you're interested in? is it parental supports is it so um and all the pictures of the facilitators are there so you know who you know who you'd be registering for um and then you just fill out a, a little form. So it's an online form. Let us know which which days and times you're looking for, which group you're interested in. If the group is closed, it just means that there are so many members in it right now that it, it might it would be hard to fit somebody else in. But when people register, um, I will then give them a call. And if they're registered for a group that's closed, I'm gonna try to find you one that's not closed or a similar time or put you on a waiting list, but then still get you into another group too. So we've added a lot. Six. Of We're adding six. We're adding six. six. So um, there's plenty of options um, and a number of them on the same nights, which is, which is great. So um, Monday through Thursday, there are tons of opportunities. So um, if you register, um, then I'll give you a call and we can kind of chat about which which is the best group for you and um, go over, you know, how to get on and, and those kinds of things. And then the facilitator sends an email out with the link and it's, it's, it's so as easy as that. Yep. Then you just and you can go on and keep your camera off if you want and just listen. You can call in and listen from a phone. Um, it's There's no obligation to share. You can try it out before anybody even knows you're there. Um, right. So uh, typically speaking, and I don't know how the other facilitators do it, but if somebody is on there and they show their face, I'm going to ask them if they want to share and ask them if they want to introduce themselves. If you turn your camera off or, law or call in, um, I typically will say something like, does anybody else want to share instead mm -hmm. of identifying the individual by name? So right, right. Um, just as a, a little word of advice. Somebody from Facebook is asking if we can talk about how support groups can help when loved ones have multiple attempts at recovery. Um, so I'm going to tell you most people's loved ones have multiple attempts at recovery. I don't necessarily see it as multiple attempts at recovery, by the way. I think it's multiple attempts or multiple times in treatment, but all of that is one attempt at recovery. Right. It's like it's this kind of how the how the ball rolls in this. It it it's usually not one and done. And there's a lot of reasons behind that. If you're interested in knowing more about that, check out um, our neurobiology behind addiction uh, webinar that we did. Paul White and I did, um, I don't know, maybe six or six, eight months ago. It's up on our website and it's up on our YouTube channel. Um, but there's there's a lot of neurological reasons why this is so hard okay it's the brain really legitimately learns that it needs this substance to live so think about if somebody was trying to take away your air right mm -hmm. what would you do to to keep to keep it you'd do anything right you'd fight you'd scream you'd steal you'd cuz you're fighting for your life so the brain has learned that it needs the substance to live so it's kicking in almost the survival instincts, right? So you, what they have, um, and this is how at least my families have come to understand it the best, I think, is you can think of it as you get this survival area in the brain that believes it needs the substance to live. And that's like a devil on the shoulder. And when they first are in recovery or first trying to get into recovery, that devil is huge, right? 
And then you got the prefrontal cortex, which is the part of our brain that does all of our critical thinking. Um, and that is the part of the brain that eventually is going to hopefully start to go, hold on a second. I don't think this might be killing me. I don't think this is saving me. I think it's killing me. Um, and that in the beginning, that angel is teeny, 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 tiny, right? And this is what treatment is. Treatment is, is teaching the angel, making the angel stronger, stronger so it can fight the devil so we can shrink it, right? So that's what's happening. But in the beginning, that middle of the brain is it's in a subconscious area and it is telling your loved ones to use the drug and your loved ones don't have access to that critical thinking in that moment to be able to say, no, thank you. This is going to kill me. It's going to hurt me. It's going to take more away than it gives. Right. So it's, it's, it's really a neurological process, you guys, and the shrinking of the devil and the growing of the angel can take some people a long time to do. And in order to do it, they probably are going to need multiple stints of not having access to the drug to really being locked away from it because access means a lot. Like we'll go back to the chocolate cake, the chocolate cake in the fridge, there's a 75 to 80% chance of eating chocolate cake. The chocolate cake is at the supermarket. That's getting shrunk, especially if it's after 8 PM, right? We're, we're going down to like probably 10 to 15%. Right? Safe at that point. <laughs> <laughs> right. So if they're in treatment and they don't have access, that devil is automatically going to shrink because access is a lot when it comes to neurology, right? So it's gonna give them an easier time to strengthen that angel. So when your loved ones are coming to you saying, I got this, I can do this on my own from home without any changes. I'm like, mm, biologically, the, the you know, it's, it's stacked against you. It's probably not gonna, I mean, there's been a few individuals that can do it, but it's very rare and it's because of biology. It's not because they're weak, it's, it's this process. Have anything to add to that, Rebecca? No, I just, I always, you phrase it so eloquently and, and the, the science behind it is, I always say that the, 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 the using addiction voice is always loudest. Yeah. Like that's the loudest voice before treatment, certainly. And the other thing is that um, people don't unlearn what they learned in treatment. So as that, right. as, as you've described it, that angel gets stronger, even if there is a relapse, even if there's a reason to go back to treatment, People don't unlearn what they've learned. They may not have access to it. So you know what I mean? When you talk right. about the brain yes, healing. They might not be in the forefront right now. But they, they haven't unlearned it. And so, and neither have we. So what we learn in our own recovery from the people that, that we love and, the, and their substance use disorder, we don't unlearn that either. Our fears sometimes get in the way of us being able to access that. But um, similarly, so I, I, in my brain, I always say that, that the devil part is that the addiction voice is very, very, very loud, louder than any voice they've ever heard before. It's, it's telling them to, you know, to breathe. I use the if you're swimming and you're, you need air at the top, it's the same. That's the same only concept. thing you're going to think about. That's, that's it. it. And I'll, and I'll get it. I'll destroy anybody in my way to get yep. that. So, um, you know, that, that is that, that loud voice and the, the, the angel growing to me is that you don't unlearn it. It's, you're still collecting it. You're still collecting it. You're still collecting it. Um, and we don't, uh, we don't unlearn it. So I don't ever feel like we're going back to the, we're going back to day one. We're not going back to day one. Um, we're going back to needing to access the information that we have. So, um, so I just don't say it as eloquently as you do, but <laughs> I like your science behind it. <laughs> Thank you. I'm, I'm such a science geek. I, I know it's wonderful. I love wonderful. science. I do. <laughs> um, but that, you know, and I, and I think that's from my perspective, what I see family members struggling with the most, including myself, by the way, um, in my situation, I still, I have to stop myself from reacting and remind myself of this all the time in my personal life. Um, I have a loved one that struggled on and off. He's doing pretty well right now, but when he's not, I, I get so angry and upset and triggered that it's hard for me to even remember that. And I'm, I'm telling you this because I want you to understand that it's not easy, right? It's not easy. I, I teach people what to do. And in my own life, I struggle to do it. Sure. This is why we need support, right? I sometimes need somebody to smack me upside the head and be like, what would you tell somebody else? You're not doing what you would teach somebody to do, <laughs> right? Oh, absolutely. And if it was my own child, I, I would, I would need 
a lot, a lot of reinforcement that I was making the right choice because sometimes the things that you know you need to do are so contrary to what you want to do Uh or what feels right Mm -hmm. that my God, it's such a hard battle. It's such a hard fight. I pray every day. I don't have to make those decisions, but I might. And, you know, I just, we, right. And no one's, no one's immune. No, No, you know, we, we, people say that all the time. And I think to myself, okay, so um, I haven't yet had to, to face that with my children and yet my kids are not immune to that. They, they have risk factors, certainly genetically, and um, they have, they will have access in this world. And, um, you know, I think I try to give them ways to cope with emotions as kind of a way to lower their risk, certainly, but they're not immune. And I think to myself, if, if, and when it, these are issues my children are facing, I know I would struggle who do I have that I would call? Who who yeah. are the, who are those you team of me. people behind me? <laughs> and right? I call you, <laughs> right? And that's and I think that that's the same message I have tried to give my children. If you are in trouble ever, who's who's in your phone? Who are you calling? Who are you gonna? You don't have to know how to do everything. Just know who you're gonna call and ask for help. Absolutely. So, um, and I think yeah. that's a really important thing too, because as a parent, I want my child to come to me with everything, but I have to be real. And I have to know <laughs> that I don't want to tell my mom everything. Mm-mm, no, no thing. I may have left a couple things out. Yeah, a few things. So I, I know that there are going to be things that he is not going to want to share with me. And by the way, as a therapist of a lot of teens, I can tell you that it's not because they don't trust you or they don't love you. It's actually the opposite. Most of our kids are so afraid of disappointing us and hurting us that they keep things from us because of that. So we have to provide them with outlets, with places and people that they can go to, to talk about it. And I'm not even just talking about kid kids, like under 18 or under 20, even your 25 to 30 year old, you can have this discussion with give them permission not to tell you everything. It's okay if you don't want to tell me, but who are you going to talk to? Cause you got to talk to somebody, right? Absolutely. Especially if they're using, who are you going to go to if you want help? I mean, you can always call the Heron Project. Our number is, um, is, you know, you can go to our website and get our phone number. Um, it, it, you, can, you can give them that and tell them to keep it in their wallet. And if at any point they want treatment or they want help, they can give us a call or go to our website and fill out a quick little form and we will call them back and we will, we will get them someplace safe. Um, you know, that's one of the things I tell my families all the time. Don't you be the person doing it because it's say, A, it's too much pressure for us and we end up doing everything and then they don't go and we get in a fight and it's, <laughs> it's a whole big mess. So you can take that whole thing off and it's a very confusing system to navigate. So a lot of yes. our loved ones, especially if they're still actively using, it's really hard for them to figure out what direction to go in. Right. So send them, tell them to go. They can go to an AA meeting. They can go to any 12 step meeting and somebody there will help them get help. I've seen it happen a thousand times. They can call Heron Project. Most of the police are actually really good now about getting people to treatment. And I don't want to say that exclusively, like do a little research about your area, because there are still some areas where the police are more into criminalizing this. But most police um, police forces now are trying to help get people connected to treatment and not put them in jail. So that's another resource, but, you know, know your resources, have these discussions with your kids. If they're of school age, have a conversation about the counselor, ask them randomly if they want to see a counselor, if there's anything they want to talk about. My son actually says to me regularly, mom, do you want me to be depressed? I think you want me to be depressed. Like, geez, I'm not depressed. I'm fine. He gets really annoyed with me because I'm always having these conversations with him. Like, are you okay? Do you think you, should we make an appointment? He's like, oh my God, I drive him crazy. But, you know, just make sure they know where to go. Right. And every school, um, certainly here in Massachusetts, but I'm sure all over the country, certainly at this point also has numerous mental health people in, in school. So um, even in in elementary school, so um, adjustment counselors, social workers, guidance counselors, school counselors, they're everywhere. And if they um, don't know the specifics, they'll find the specifics. So if, if they don't have the resource right there in the school, they'll find it, but that's what, that's what we do. So. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yep. And um, also 
I don't know if everybody's aware of this. One thing we haven't mentioned yet is that Heron Project has a recovery meeting also seven mm -hmm. nights a week at 730. It's an open link. You can get the link right from our website. And that's for people who are in recovery. Um, it's an awesome meeting. People absolutely love it. There's a ton of cohesion in that group too. So if you have a loved one that's struggling right now um, to get to 12 step meetings, you know, send them our way, let them know that the link is there. And sometimes family members will drop into that too. If they just want to get a sense of, you know, what goes on with people in recovery and what it's like. Um, and they're open to that too. It's not a closed meeting. So that's important too, to hear, um, for family members. I, I, I frequently invite my, my family members from group to, to go and listen, because I think, um, the perception that, like you said earlier, once, um, our loved one is in treatment. Okay. All done. We're good. We did it. We're good. Yep. And to hear somebody's story where they may have maybe started this journey at 26 and they're 42 and what that looked like and what that entailed, um, it's important for families to hear, you know, yeah. that there's hope, mm -hmm. you know, that, that recovery exists, um, yeah. you know, but, but it doesn't always look like, I, I hate, to me, very visual. I always say that we, it's great if we could just paint the picture of recovery for all of our, you know, we just, but our paintbrush is broken and it doesn't, it doesn't work. It would be that. an abstract painting of every color in the, in the palette and every variation of every right. color in the palette. Right. The palette. And, but, it's, but it's just not ours to, to paint. Yeah. So that's, you know, um, but I think it is, that's a, that's a great resource for people to be able to see what real recovery looks like. It's not always graceful. It's not always beautiful. It's not always peaceful, um, but it exists and it's real. And, and that's, that's nice to be able to see. And I think oftentimes we see people who are in recovery, like, um, you know, our executive director, Kevin Michael mm -hmm. or Chris Heron or, yep. Um, Paul White, you know, a lot of the people who work for the Heron Project sure. who are professionals. And um, we think that their journey must have been different than our loved ones because our loved ones are so sick. And then you hear their stories and you're like, oh, dear God, no, they're exactly Same journey. Right. Most of you know Chris's story. So mm -hmm. that's more typical of substance Absolutely. disorder than the people who struggle a little and then get themselves help and then they're out. That doesn't yeah. happen. And I always like to explain the differences in the diagnoses too, because there is substance use disorder and there's problem use. So problem use is when I'm drinking too much or I'm using too much and uh, consequences start to come. And I'm like, oh geez, I need to stop this. This is bad. Um, so I stop and I get my life together and I move on. That was actually my experience throughout my teens and early twenties. I probably, I was on my way to substance use disorder. Consequences started to come and I was like, mm, I don't think I want to be working a bagel for the rest of my life, making right. $9 an hour. I got to do something. So I stopped and I went to college, right? Where um, a lot of the people that I was spending time with at that point, my ex-husband is one of them. Um, they couldn't stop and they kept going and no matter how many consequences came, they still kept on using, kept on partying. That is when it's substance use disorder typically, right? So, I mean, I probably could have gone to 12 step meetings at that point and got my life together and moved on. Um, but that's problem use, right? I didn't really need treatment. And it's not up to me to decide what somebody, how somebody identifies, Right. So I don't want you guys going out and being like, well, you got clean really easily. So you must be problem use. If they identify as substance use disorder, let them identify as that. Yes. But sometimes I, in my head, I'll wonder if they didn't actually have that strong mm -hmm. genetic component or significant trauma or an interplay of both mm -hmm. that got them into substance use disorder. Right. right. So, so once somebody has substance use disorder, they're probably going to be in and out a few times. It's probably going to take a while for them to stop most likely. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, just kind of know the difference. And if you're struggling with a teen who's using, say, too much marijuana, which is very frequent these days, that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to end up with substance use disorder either. Not to mm -hmm. say you shouldn't intervene and do your best to help them. Absolutely. Don't assume that problem use is going to be substance use disorder, right? You're only going to know once the consequences come, really the difference. And until the consequences come, you're probably going to have a hard time getting the person to stop because that's there's no motivation to human nature, you know, like I didn't stop drinking caffeine until <laughs> I was having a problem with my blood sugar. Right? Like <laughs> that's so true. Difficult. So, and this is where you guys can come in because you can start to create some of those natural consequences um, based on the things you can control. 
So I can tell you that if my son started smoking a lot of pot, he wouldn't get the car that I bought for him. The keys would be mine again. And it wouldn't be to punish him. It would be because it's not safe to drive around high. So if you're driving around high, that car's mine, dude, right? Natural consequence of use. And that can be said for your 20 somethings that are like, you can't Absolutely. take the car away. I have to go to work. I'd be like, I'm not going to let you kill yourself or someone else in that car. Find another way to get to work or stop using the drug. I'm happy to get you into treatment, right? right. Like I'm not letting you take that car. No way. That's a natural consequence for the use. Um, and this is the stuff you can talk about in these support groups that we can help you figure out what the natural consequences right. are that you can start to implement based on where you're ready to make change. Right. Right. Absolutely. What things are we ready to do to help make them um, the ones we love uncomfortable enough that treatment is, a, is the best option. Yep. Back to the chocolate cake, you guys. I never go on a diet or change my eating habits until my genes are uncomfortable. Yes. Right? Never. Well, well that, that could be because the dryer shrinks them. Sometimes I like I to like think that sometimes, but then, you know, I kind of got to be real every once in a while with I myself. Understand. myself yeah. But human nature is that we right. don't change until, we're until uncomfortable. the pain comes, right? <laughs> my favorite, have you ever heard the story of the lobster, Rebecca? I don't know. It's my favorite. So the only time, so a lobster, right? They can't grow in their shell because their shell is hard, right? So the only way that it can grow is to shed that shell and grow another one, right? How do you think it knows when to shed the shell? It doesn't fit. It becomes painful, right? It becomes uncomfortable and in pain in that shell. And then it sheds the shell and grows another one. And that process is scary because the Lobster is now without its shell, which is its main protection. It has to be vulnerable for a little while before it grows the new shell and yet feels comfortable again, right? Guess who's just like the lobster? We're all lobsters. We're lobsters. We're just <laughs> bigger, smarter versions of the lobster, yeah. right? So not that. only are our loved ones going through the process, but we are too. So we have to give both of us grace and compassion and understand that this is hard work and that change makes you feel vulnerable right? Change never comes until there's pain. So hang in there and don't give up hope. And remember the story of the lobster. Love the lobster. <laughs> You're going to use I, that. Now, aren't you? I love that. <laughs> I'm going to get, I'm going to get a, a stuffed lobster and put it in my office. Nice. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. awesome. I bring up the lobster all the time. It's important. I always say, you know, the change is one step outside our comfort zone, mm -hmm. you know, until the pain gets great enough, all of it. But so I like that if I have a visual yeah, right. I got to yep. get a lobster. And my favorite part of that is the reminder that when you're changing up a pattern, the We're new, the new pain, the new pattern is going to feel super uncomfortable and super, you're going to be super vulnerable because a lot of people will start to make a change and it scares the hell out of them. Cause they're like, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know if this is going to work, even though the other pattern didn't work. It's a pattern that you understand and feels comfortable. So even if it's a painful pattern, we hang on to them because the changing of the pattern makes us feel so, un so vulnerable so and anxious that it's hard to change. Right. So sometimes we, not sometimes all the time when we're making change, we have to step into that anxiety and that's when you meditate and <laughs> sleep and exercise and all the things we talked about earlier to help you get through that process, but and join a support group. Yes. And join a support group. <laughs> yep. You have any last minute, anything, Rebecca? I don't, I don't, I don't. I just, I just know that there's so many opportunities um, for, for people to join us um, and learn from us and with us um, and teach us. So um, for anybody who needs, please, please, please reach out. There are many yeah. opportunities on our website, many modes of, of communication. So find us so we can, we can be of help. Absolutely. And we, we'd love to have you. We're growing. If you have any ideas on any support groups that we can add, please mm. reach out to us and yes. let us know. Um, like Rebecca said, we have, I don't even know how many family groups we have right now. A lot. Um, we have a lot of them. I couldn't, I couldn't even tell you. Um, starting up a sibling group, starting up that grief group um, for people that are struggling with a loved one who's still actively using. Um, and we're starting up a whole new bunch of family groups. So a please lot. check out our website. If there are any of you um, on the West Coast, we are going to be starting up a later one that should be about 6 p.m. for you. Um, it's, it's, it'll be 9 p.m. for us. Um, so if, if you need a later group, check the website. Hopefully that one will be starting up in like a month. Um, so we'll have a, 
a 530 on the West Coast um, family group starting as well, probably in the next two or three weeks Okay, awesome. on Monday nights. So okay. you actually, middle... I shouldn't let you do that. You know no, no, no. It's, so it's 830 um, Eastern time, but and, so 530 okay. for the for the West Coast. So we got to okay. we're trying to find, you know, how to get everybody's needs met. It's hard with with time change, but um, we got it. We're trying and we're going we're to be hoping to add more and more later night ones, maybe some weekend ones as well. We've tried yeah. them historically. They haven't taken off, but I think, you know, with COVID um, we might have more opportunities. People are around. Yeah. So. Okay. You guys Thanks for having me. awesome. Thank you so much for joining us, Rebecca. Oh, we'll definitely, pleasure. definitely be having you on again. Might even have you run one sometime. I would love that. <laughs> I know you will. <laughs> okay. Thank you guys. Thank you.